Welcome to the Wingman Show. My name is Drew Brown. We float like a butterfly and we sting like bees. Rumble, you badass jet pilots, rumble. Welcome to the Wingman Show. My wingman, the guy who watches my six all the time, my main man, Dr. Paul Thompson. What's up, Dr. Paul? How you doing today? Pretty good today. Pretty good. I'm up and alive. It's a uh, nice day over here. It's very misty, misty and uh, foggy, unusual. The weather's changing. It's getting cooler, which is cool. Well, you know, when it was misty and foggy, I used to love to fly my A6 intruder over the mountains, and that's how we would surprise the enemy. But truthfully, behind me is a tornado that you got me. It's a beautiful airplane. Anybody on YouTube, you can look at it. It's gorgeous. The British actually used it. The Saudis used it. The Italians used it. And it can go up to 1,500 miles per hour. This is a cool thing. Supersonic, it can go 345 miles with the afterburners. But if you don't put the afterburners on, it can go almost 1,200 miles. The armament, it has 122 mic cannon. It can carry four sidewinders, four AMRAMs, and it can carry two drop tanks. And you and I know a lot about drop tanks because sometimes we had to be tankers on the carrier, Dr. Paul. Thank you for that beautiful sunset, that picture of that tornado. What do you got behind you? Uh, so it's just a landing F-18. It's taken from the back of, I guess, the uh, LSO platform, landing signal officers. The guy there, he's not a landing signal officer. He's a yellow shirt. And that's usually like a plane director that directs planes on the deck. Airplanes landing. Yeah, the F-18, it's the uh, mainstay of the U.S. Navy now for a while. Premier fighter. It's F-A, fighter and attack. They can fight in the sky and drop bombs. Combat radius is about 450 miles unrefueled. I mean, you can go about 450 miles and come back. With refueling, you can go, you know, for a long, long time. Carries the same kind of weapons, missiles, bombs, all kinds of bombs, air-to-ground bombs. Uh, it's uh, And it's there's an electronic version that replaced your EA-6. They call it the Growler. It's like EF-18. Which is very very interesting. Wow, I didn't even know that. I didn't. Yeah, know yeah, yeah. It's, it's called the called the called the growler, not the prowler, the growler. Wow, that's pretty cool, Doctor Paul. Thank you so much. You know, our newsletter is out, and you're going to do something on a money market this time. We want to welcome all our frequent flyers, and that's the people who listen to us all the time. And any of you mm -hmm. new flyers, anybody who's listening to us for the first time, please write a little review if you like us on Apple Podcasts. We really would appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right, shout outs time, shout out time, shout out time. Dr. Paul, I think you have a shout out time to my man, SS. He asked you a question. Yes, SS. SS asked a question about push ups, how you do 700 push ups. The answer is like really one at a time. <laughs> uh, no, it's really, it sounds, it sounds impossible, but it really isn't. Uh, I do burpees sometimes without jumping up. You go from a standing position, go to a push-up position, do one push-up, and stand up. I don't jump. It's a little hard on the knees. I'll run in place for five seconds instead of jumping. I'm Let me ask you this. He asked oh. you how long it took you. How long it took I did it in about, it was probably about 50 minutes. And I take breaks. I drink water. It's not nonstop. I'd, I'd be dead. Take. I do a few. I could drop down, and instead of doing one push-up, I might do five. A hundred times, I can do five hundred. This time I did seven. That time I did seven. On my birthday, which is New Year's Day, I'm, I'm I'll probably go for eight or nine to see if I can do it. Now I'll take a lot of time with it. But you just do a few. You know, you do ten of them. You've done you've done eighty push-ups or done seventy push-ups. Now for everybody out there who can't do seven hundred push-ups like me, we do the best we can, but we keep adding and adding and adding. And Doctor Paul has been very regimented in his workouts his whole life. And that's why he's up to 700. The average person, you know, like me, I want to work out and I want to get better and stronger. So 700 sounds like a lot. But thank you, SS, for that shout out. We love you guys. Hey, how about this? How about Magic Mind, our sponsors? I'm on day 21. Dr. Paul, you I'm too. popped. I'm feeling good. I'm getting more productivity. It's true. Whatever they're saying, it actually is coming to fruition. And Katrina's now taking it. She ordered some. And I'll tell you what, I haven't seen my wife complete tasks like she's completing in a while. It's almost dizzying. And she told me that her memory is starting to improve. Oh, good. How about that one? Good. That's that's really good. Yeah, I'm getting 
getting better, more purposeful, uh, maybe a little better, a little better attitude in the in the middle wow. of the day. I noticed it's a little, 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 little better, but I'm uh, it's improved me too. Well, some you know they they said this on Magic Mind on the website, and first of all, it's Magic Mind dot co magic mind dot co if you want to join with us and try this magic mind you can put in the code wingman show 14 i'll put that out on the screen wingman show 14 and you get about up to 40 percent off i believe i really like this stuff i i really do and i'm getting more stuff done and that's what it's for it's for productivity yeah, I take I take mine in the morning, like first thing. I think that I guess you could probably do it anytime, but I think it's most efficient for me in the first, in the morning. And I drink mine with my coffee, so I'm fired up. I'm fired up right now. I'm almost as fired up as you were this weekend when you went to go see that same airplane you got behind you, that super badass Hornet. You went and saw the Blue Angels. Tell me something about it. We have some pictures of you and your grandson. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, watch it. But Dr. Paul, how was it? Yeah, it was nice. It was a nice show. I hadn't seen them, hadn't seen the blue and blues in I don't know, it's five, six, seven years, well pre-COVID. It was nice. It was uh unusual in that the weather was perfect and it was like it was November, but it felt like it was summer. It's probably by 85 degrees. No, it's probably by 83 degrees. There were that was the biggest crowd I've ever seen at an air show at this airport. It was about twice as many as normal. Uh Good exhibitions out there. There was stuff from all the services. The uh, the army had a had a big presence. The navy uh, medium presence. Air force medium. Most of it was army. A little bit of coast guard. A lot of security. And I was very surprised in that the the blues were right there because that airport's a small airport in Peachtree in uh, Peachtree City. And I thought the runway might be too small for them, and they'd come from another place and fly over and go back. No, they were there. All six airplanes were parked out on the on the ramp, and they took off. did a, Did a very nice show. They changed the shows uh, every year. Sometimes they add some stuff. Sometimes they take away things. But it was a beautiful day. A lot of uh, really really good formation flying and loud. The Super Hornets are louder than the uh, the other ones. That's a little bit too much for my for my grandson at one point. So we gave him some some earplugs. But I really I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. It looked like you did. And I love that sound. To me, it's the sound of freedom. And I forgot to say this last week when I saw the blues practicing, but I am so proud to be an American. And I'm so proud to have fought for this country. I'm not an African-American. All people from America are African-Americans because mankind started in Africa. And I do want to say this. I am sick and tired of this race BS because it will never win lying. We are one race. We are the human race. We are homo sapiens. The only thing that separates us are our cultures. And until we can start learning the truth and dealing with each other that like that, we won't understand anything about us. There are no different races. There are different species, like gorillas and lions and birds. And then there are homo sapiens. And that's what we are. We're homo sapiens. And I say all that because a tear did come to my eye. I fought for this country and I was ready to lose my life for this country. I love my America. America doesn't mean white. It means free. Land of the free and home of the brave. And Dr. Paul, you and I are both. Now, I know we're brave and we're free, but I wish we would have hit this Powerball. The Powerball just went in for $2.4 billion dollars, which means you got almost a billion if you won and somebody did win and it wasn't us. But you and I were talking this week because, you know, we work all week to try to find some of these stories. And we were talking about greed. And that's one of the eight deadly sins, greed, the curse of insatiability. In other words, you can't ever get enough. But one of the things that we talked about with this greed is family inheritances, because When you get to our age, people start dying, I'm sorry to say. People who haven't taken care of their inheritance the right way cause a lot of trouble. My family, my great-great-grandmother had a plot of land in Sanford, Florida. My family is now fighting over it. Well, let me not say a plot of land. Let me say a lot next to a crack house. Not worth anything. But my family 
because of the bickering, the inside, the outside. They won't let it go. And I don't know the, what's going to happen is the state of Florida is going to wind up owning that land. And again, my wife, Katrina, her aunt died and left 80 acres to like 10 people or so. And it's going to take forever for them to figure it out because they have grandchildren and children. And what's going to happen is the state of Mississippi will own that land. I don't know what happens when money gets involved, but maybe we were lucky for not winning that $2.4 billion Powerball. Because I'll tell you what, if I won it, the first thing I do is I pay somebody to make sure nobody ever knew I won it. That's right. Dr. Paul, tell me about family inheritance, greed, and your Powerball. Yeah, well, the, as far as the Powerball, it's funny. I was curious about that. And most people that that uh, that handle that who represent the winners, they all tell you the same thing. Don't tell anybody unless you have to. Tell the fewest number of people. Get a, a team ready of a tax accountant, tax attorney, a representative to go pick it up for you so you don't have to reveal yourself. Uh, that's the first thing, because bad things can happen. Just just from a security standpoint is obvious. Yeah, yeah, I bought a few, I bought a few tickets and uh I only missed by six numbers. <laughs> don't throw your numbers. tickets away, everybody. You need to check them because yeah, they have a lot of prizes and a lot of people just throw those tickets away. And right. there are millions of dollars that get lost in that. I don't know if people know that or not. Yeah, yeah, but the th- the thing is to uh you know, people people fight over, you know, people fight over $75. I think the big thing is and we're talking you're talking about your grandmother and older things cuz our family has kind of a similar similar situation. But you really need to write things down. There's so many ways to write things down. Nobody knows. And if you don't write things down and you pass away in the US, you know, if you don't have a will or an estate plan, you die what they call intestate, essentially, and you don't have a will. So the government decides, or the local government decides, you know, what happens to your property. That can be avoided very easily by having a will, having something, something written down and put somewhere virtually where it can't be destroyed or lost. Nobody knows where it is. Now well, do what we school. did with our, remember when we went to see a school and we got our certificates and yes. we made copies and put them everywhere so we would not never lose them? Because okay. they said if we lost them, we'd have to go back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, ur- urban, urban legends, like, you know, Amelia Earhart is in New Jersey, and if you lose your serious, you got to go again. Mine is like about two feet away from me in a metal box. <laughs> and I got three copies of it. Yeah, make copies of it, give it to other people so someone can't take it, tear it up, and put a replacement copy. All that kind of stuff happens. There's so many things you can do now. It, and a will doesn't cost anything. It can be very simple. You know, you're not splitting a, a fortune. And you can just decide, you know, who gets what when. And you can be as specific as you want and take all the emotion and craziness out of it. Some people fight over stuff for generations, I understand. But if there's a lot of money. Anybody can challenge it. Oh, but- yeah. What happens when it's millions and millions and millions? My family won't let go of a, a stinking lot next to a crack house. Could you right. imagine if we had 4,000 acres? Yeah, yeah. You can imagine the people at the crack house, if they got their act together and you didn't pay your taxes, they That's might like, buy it. At, they could buy it at a tax sale. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to happen. Write, this, write it down. And if you've got a lot of stuff going, pay a little money, get an estate plan, set you back a few bucks, but you take all the craziness out of it and everything can be decided in 90 days, not 90 years. Well, what happens is when you grow up, you need to be more responsible. I didn't do a will for a long time. I'll be very honest with you, because I think it's like talking about my death. But the truth is, if I love the people that I say I love, then I need to do something that's responsible. And that was to make a will. And I'll tell you something. I'm glad my daddy didn't leave me anything because everything I worked for, everything I have, I worked for myself. And that was one of my parents' greatest gift to me, to allow me to do it myself. Because I'll tell you what. If you grow up with money and you've had money, the world is not as easy as you think it is because you don't have that inner ability to take care of yourself, you think. And when you look around you as you get older, you wonder, did I do any of this? So I don't have to wonder about that. And I don't think you do either, Dr. Paul. No, 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 no. It's good. You know, sometimes some struggle is is good. That's how you build your muscles, your, your emotional muscles, your physical muscles. 
Some struggle is good. Well, that's what they say. We say times of struggle are times of growth proportionally. That's in the facts in life. All right. You want to hear something cool? Sure. You know those barcodes that we see that everybody's scanning now? You scan, scan, scan. Right. What if I told you they're not scanning those black lines? They're what scanning they the white ones. Would you ever think that? No, I, I thought it would be the whole thing. Okay. That's a good one. How about this? There's a certain frog that people are starting to capture and lick because it gets them high psychedelically. And they're licking these frogs and they're abusing them. You want to tell me something about the frog licking? I read about that. That's to, to get some kind of a high. Psychedelic. Uh, psychedelic high. I would say my public service announcement without a megaphone is don't do that. Don't do that. Leave the frogs alone. Did you know, and you probably know because you're a dog expert, that if a dog, if a dog bites into a toad, it can get poisoned. Toad poisoning. Toad poison, poisoning can be fatal to dogs. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, it can be fatal to dogs. It can it can have seizures and they, they can die. So, so what if you list so these people are trying to get high licking frogs, they'll mess around and lick a toad. Yeah, it's don't do this. <laughs> do not do not do this. Do not do this. The toad may like it, but uh it can have uh, devastating effects. Here's some cool stuff I think you'd love. Dr. Paul, you know those dragonflies we see all the time? Yes. Well, you know, when we had cat shots off the carrier, we used to take G's. That's how fast we go from zero to 135. And I think we were pulling four G's and kicking our ass. Well, dragonflies actually hit four G's when they take off. And when they turn, when they make a corner, they're pulling nine G's, Dr. Paul. They go 35 miles an hour. And the baddest thing about these badass dragonflies, they have a 95% kill rate. 95% of the things they go after, they kill. Wow. Nine Gs. That's 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 more than the F-18. I think the F-18 is good to seven and a half, and the F-16 will do nine Gs. That's, yeah, uh, have you ever pulled nine Gs? No, no, no. I, I, I might have I might have been close to seven a couple. So I've definitely done seven two, a few times. I think that's I did seven and a half at a Tomcat with Chuck Nesby. Okay. When he was flying it. Yeah. When I was a student, he took me up and I think I did seven and a half G's. And I mean, you're blacking out is what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not used to it, you got to tense your stomach up. Yeah. When we say G's, we're talking about, you know, acceleration force. Yeah. Nine your body, times your body weight. Yeah. It's, your, it's like your body weight. So even though your, your, your weight's staying the same, you're making a maneuver and orienting yourself with gravity such that you get this force on your body. And it typically goes down to your feet, goes down to your toes. So people wear these G suits that inflate when it senses the G. So all your blood doesn't go from your brain to your feet and you just pass out. It may happen anyway. But the yeah, G we suit wore right G suits when we flew. Yeah, you needed them. Yes, yes. Well, you know, we just went through a real big political vote sequence and elections and everything. And I wanted to make this comment because we don't talk about politics on either side. We'll talk about actually politics as a whole, but we're not going to take sides right here. That's our own personal business. But I will tell you this, as much excitement as all these people are making about politicians, do you know what? My life doesn't change the day after the election, no matter who wins. Because the only thing that changes in my life are things that I do to make a change. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was completion of tasks. You know, my whole life, I've been going around saying, go to college, go to college, go to college. The truth is, I really want to say, go to college, complete it. You have to finish college. You have to get a degree. Whenever you start something, you must complete it. You have to finish it in order to say you did it. You know, I can't say I was going to be a Navy jet pilot. I had to go through and do it. Dr. Paul, tell me about completion of tasks, because I think a lot of people start a lot of things, and God bless for this magic mind, I think that helps you with completion of tasks. But a lot of people don't complete what they start. Yeah, there's some uh, wisdom uh, uh, an old friend of mine gave me many, many years ago. It's very simple, and it's, it's easy to remember. And he was an international businessman. He said, it's not what you start, it's what you finish. It's very, it's, it's very simple. 
but it's so easy to get distracted and, and, and despondent and abandon something that you really need to just to complete by just keeping your nose to the grindstone, just sticking with it. And sometimes that's hard. And that's part of what we were talking about earlier about, you know, emotional muscle, physical muscle, just get getting practice at at struggle or challenge. Let's just not say struggle, let's say challenge, good challenge. Uh, so many people. That's will, the only way you can dig a hole is to dig a hole. You're going to have to have a shovel. You're going to have to have a little power. You're going to have to have some strength. You're going to have to use some energy. But that's the only way you'll get a hole. You can have a ground, a shovel, and you, and nothing happens. Yeah. And you talk about college, and sometimes there's a you know a fairly high dropout rate in college. The average four-year degree takes most people seven years now to complete for different reasons. Well, and it took some me five years, but that's because I was having fun. Yeah, you're having fun. Yeah, you're doing something. You're 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 getting ready for your road scholarship or something like that. That's what you tell people. You know, I you know the the Knicks offered me a contract, so I played for them for a couple of years and took my time off before I became a rocket scientist. But the thing is that a lot of people get despondent uh, when they get into uh, in the college ranks because they've kind of had it easy in high school, easy before, and now they may be in a situation where they've got they got to face what they call academic rigor, where you really got to work at something. It's not just you know, the, I'm the star at Umpty Frats Elementary School and the bumper stickers and all that nice stuff. You know, you, you take away the fluff. You've got to you've got to really compete. You've got to do stuff. It's hard. It's not just neat and easy. And so when you're learning physics or chemistry or something like that, it's maybe a little more complicated than like two times two and three times three. You may have to use your, your brain more so. And if you're not used to that, it's, you know, oh, this is terrible. No, what you're going through is average. What you're going through is average. It's yeah, you know, most people don't realize that it takes hard work to do anything that's worthwhile. Right. And everybody, including myself, look for the easy way out. Well, Dr. Paul, I got to tell you something. I found it. The easy way out is doing it the right way the first time. That's right. the quickest way for success. And right. you know what? That leads me to a wingman. PSA. This is the wingman PSA. From the facts in life, fact in life number eight, emit integrity. Don't lie, cheat, or steal. Power is asking for help and using it. Don't be needy and have honor. Emit integrity. And that was a wingman PSA. That's one of the most incredible things that I've seen a human being do, and that's to have integrity. And that's to know that you're an honest person, and that's to walk around with honor. True. All right. Do you know, I always ask everybody how much you make since I've been little. I And people don't ask people that. Well, in order for me to find out what I want to be when I grew up, I had to ask how much you made. I wanted to put all the information together. So we're going to do this. We're going to start giving some salaries out on the Wingman Show and maybe tell you how to get there. Dr. Paul, how much does a petroleum engineer make? The average salary of a petroleum engineer, because you are an engineer. What do you think the average salary is? Okay, petroleum engineering. That's a that's a new discipline from from when I went to school. I'm going to say that's probably uh, uh, an expansion from what they used to call chemical engineering. I'm going to say uh, probably the average is I'm going to it's probably three digits. I'm going to say say a hundred and hundred and two thousand dollars, hundred and forty five thousand seven hundred a okay. year. Okay. So the average salary is one hundred and forty five thousand. That means some people are making one hundred and two, and some people are making two hundred. Okay. Okay. Now, what do you need for an engineer degree? Uh, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's at least I'm sure it's at least four years for for a BS. Or a bachelor of science. I don't know how. They and do you think you need a master's to be a, a manager in that? I don't know. Uh, maybe that's not unusual. Okay, let's go to doctors. My son's a spine surgeon, but I'm not going to ask you. My son's a board certified spine surgeon, Dr. Drew Brown the Fourth. Mm-hmm. My daughter's an attorney, but how much does an anesthesiologist make? And that's the people who give the Michael Jackson juice out. Okay. And I'm going to Pope say, Paul. Paul. 
310. Good. $331,000 a year. That's the That's average. Some make a half a million, some make 200. Right. Last one, a computer technical technology manager. You know, this this new thing computer technology is very big right now. Yeah. How much do you think a manager of uh I'll, I'll go 140. 162.9. Okay. okay. Of course. So all these things are attainable. And, you know, when I came up with a decision when I was 26, what do I want to be when I grew up? And I picked the airline pilot. I think it was number 12 in the salaries. Yeah. While, while they're working. <laughs> while they're working. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Paul, we're going to do something special. We have wingmen this week. And you're going to do one. I'm going to do one. But they're both the same sort of story. So, Dr. Paul, will you start me off with your wingman today? Okay. Well, sometimes uh, man's best friend needs a needs a best friend. And this is I want to talk about a place called the Big Dog Ranch Rescue. Big Dog Ranch Rescue is a uh, company, a concern based out of Florida, now expanding into Alabama, but they're in Loxahatchee, Florida. And uh, I think it's not too far from Palm Beach. But they basically rescue dogs, rescue dogs in a big way. They've Over the years, they started in 2008, and they've rescued about 53,000 dogs. And they're expanding their facilities in uh, Alabama, shorter Alabama. And they're building, they just recently obtained like a 33-acre property, and they're uh, – they hope to, to house or save like 5,000 dogs per year at this place in Alabama. And one of the good things that they do, aside from you know, rescuing pets, is reuniting them with, with other older owners. Sometimes the uh, owners pass away, elderly people pass away, and the, the, uh, the pets are still living. And they're trying to reunite them, well, not reunite them, trying to pair them up with older people that are looking for you know, four-legged friends. Also, another good thing that they do is they pair uh, service personnel who've had traumatic brain injuries or PTSD with these dogs who would be suitable to help them with physical challenges and mental challenges. And if they, they pair them up, they actually give them like 300 hours of training in addition. This is a philanthropic uh, thing, and uh, they take donations. They do very, very, very good work. Wow, that's that's so wonderful. And guess what is far away from Alabama? What? Shanghai. And in Shanghai, there's a Buddhist monk. His name is Zizang. And since 1994, he has saved 8,000 dogs himself. Now, this is very interesting because in Buddhism, the highest goal is to reach the fourth stage of consciousness whereby the trappings of reality kind of fall away and the person realizes life is merely an illusion. That's what they believe. That's the fourth state. Well, how about this? The highest Buddhas are called Bahasivatas, and they don't choose this path. They choose a path to remain in the world and try to help people stuck in the cycle of life to escape. And that's what this Buddhist monk is. And since 1994, he has saved 8,000 dogs in Shanghai. It costs him about $2.5 million a year. And he, he also takes these dogs and he puts them uh, with families in Canada, America, China, all over the world. And I will tell you something. In karma, if you get what you give, this Buddhist monk is going to get a lot. And so are those people in Alabama. Because anytime you take care of things that can't take care of themselves, I believe you have a golden gift. Dr. Paul, once again, you're the man, and I pray for peace. I pray for peace, too, and thank you. Thank you once again, Dr. Paul Thompson, my friend. Thank you for your love, your time, and that's something that we won't ever get back. I want to thank all the listeners, too. Thank you so much for doing the show, Dr. Paul. We're jamming. Well, thank you, Mr. Drew, for inviting me on. Always good to talk to you. And ladies and gentlemen, Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast or any of the podcasts. If you're looking at YouTube, uh, they say smash the like button. Don't smash it. Just press it gently and refer to it. Use as a link to all your friends. 
You can also look at us on our website, wingmenshow.com, W-I-N-G-M-E-N, show, S-H-O-W.com, all together, wingmenshow.com. And we hope to see you in the future. Thanks again, Mr. Drew. Oh, you're welcome. And we're still floating like butterflies and stinging like bees. Rumble, you badass jet pilots, rumble. May there be peace on earth and goodwill towards all men and women.